Hi folks, um, I just want to say a few words about the uh, chapter on issues in diversity. First of all, let's define what diversity is. Oftentimes we think of diversity as um, uh, race or ethnicity, and, and by all means that's part of diversity. But we have to think more broadly than that um, in terms of socioeconomic status, in terms of language, um, in terms of culture and social background. And so when we look at Maine, um, across the state of Maine, we'd say it's not a very diverse state. Um, and, but we think that, that when we say that, we're thinking that, that in terms of ethnicity and, um, and race. And granted, it's a very white state. Um, however, we do have pockets um, of diversity, and if we define it in those terms, uh, mainly our urban areas, um, but that's also growing into more suburbia as well. That's a good thing for the state of Maine. Um, but we also have to think about the diversity in terms of of uh, impoverished children who come to school without the the, the proper preparation um, for engaging in academic work. Uh, they may not have the, the same kinds of advantages that those students who come from um, from middle class or upper class homes have. Um, I've given you some readings this week to to really look at that. Um, the, the issue of poverty and how that affects students in school. It's, it's, a, it's a huge issue in the, in the state of Maine and across the country. So I want you to pay close attention to that. I also want to talk a little bit about um, multicultural education and what that, that means for us as teachers. You know, historically our, our textbooks and curricula has been very Western based and it, and it continues to be. Um, the history is taught from a, a colonial um, Western expansion viewpoint. Um, we often look at multicultural issues in, with a kind of a tokenism um, um, pass at it. In other words, we highlight various ethnicities at various points. We have African American Month. We have Women's Month. Um, uh, we may highlight Native Americans at a per certain time, but that but they're all sort of additives to the curriculum. Um, and the curriculum continues to be very Western focused, and I think that we have to think carefully about that. While we want to educate our children about that aspect of our history and that aspect of our world, we also want them to understand that, that we are a very diverse world and that there are many ways of being in the world and many ways of thinking about the world. Um, and if we don't help them to understand those things, you know, we're going to perpetuate these misunderstandings and these arguments and these um, um, ideological um, roadblocks that keep us from getting along with one another. And so I think it's just important that we stop for a minute and think about who we are as teachers um, and what our own biases are. And I, we all have biases. It's just, it's part of being human. But being able to understand those and being able to overcome those in a classroom is going to be very important. I wanted to point out to you um, on pages... I should have written the pages down, and I didn't do that. Um, on page 469, um, taking it to the classroom, it, there's this, it says connect with kids and parents of different cultures. And it's a self-quiz on what are your assumptions. Um, and the questions are, what are the different cultures in my school? Okay, and stop and think about, you know, if you think about your own school that you went to, or if you're working in a school currently, you know, what, what kinds of um, different cultures are there in that school? Um, what characteristics first come to mind when I think of each group? So these are these are the assumptions that we sort of have, and it's a it's a really good it's a really good quiz to take. So if you name five different cultures, you know what's the first thing that comes to mind? Um, is that and think to yourself: Is that a positive or is that a negative? So how am I thinking about these various cultural groups? What care? Um, where did these impressions come from? So then examine that. You know, how did I, how, why do I think that? And what was, why was that the first thing? Did it come from peers, family, media, religion, etc.? How reliable, reliable are these sources? And then how do I treat people based on these impressions? And can I remember a time when someone made assumptions about me based on a group I belong to? How did it make me feel? I think these those questions are really good for self-examination of our own biases. And I encourage you all to take that little quiz and really to reflect about what you, what you believe about various groups of people. Um, and we, we can all say that we, we, we believe in a, an inclusive education, and I'm sure we all do. But yet, you know, we still have we still have these inherent biases in us, even though we say we don't. So I want you to really, really think about it and, and look at those. And then you should continue down the page. 
um, where do biases begin and how culture affects behavior and how to build a buffer against bias. So that, that section on page 469 I think is really, really important um, for you to pay attention to in terms of becoming a teacher of diverse children. And you will become teachers of diverse children um, if you are becoming teachers. If you're taking this course, um, you know, as a psychology course still, it's important to understand um, what it means to interact with diverse uh, groups of people. Um, also at the top of that page, um, it lists two strategies to help teachers become aware of and reflect on their attitudes towards others, okay? Um, one is, um, is to, the one I just gave you to ask you to reflect on. And the second one um, asks you to become aware of and reflect on your instructional approach and how culturally, culturally relevant or sensitive it is to students' diversity and cultural group memberships. So think about, think to your own own education uh, in public school um, about what, you know, how, how was, how, how were you taught and was it culturally sensitive to other groups? Um, and I'm, I'm going to guess that mostly it was taught, you know, from a Western viewpoint to a hetero, a homogeneous group of students who were pre predominantly Caucasian. Um, I, I don't know that, but I'm just, I'm, my own experience and, and having done this with students in the past, um, that's kind of really what where we, our mindset is. Um, so thinking about that, I'd like us to think then what it means to, to teach in a culturally um, sensitive context and to provide students with not just an additive um, kind of, uh, of teaching, but to also provide them with, you know, a more, more um, um, con inclusive Okay, so on page 467, um, the section is called Digging Deeper, Looking at Various Multicultural Approaches to Education. Um, and James Bank is sort of a forerunner in this. If you were in 250, you'll remember that we talked about this in 250, um, about uh, these various approaches. So one is contributions approach. Um, this is where we, we sort of um, look at ethnic figures who challenge the dominant view um, and that are not included in the program. So people like um, Harriet Tubman, um, Frederick Douglass, uh, Susan B. Anthony, um, people who from a from a cultural group who stood out, um, um, who was not the dominant group. Um, so so it's just look, sort of looking at those contributions that those those people made. And then a second approach is the additive approach. Okay, where where this expands the co contributions approach. Um, ethnic concepts, themes, points of view, and accomplishments, as well as key ethnic figures are added to the curriculum, but the perspective from which they are viewed is largely informed by a mainstream um, values. Okay, so we're getting a little bit more into um, highlighting some of these ethnic figures, but they're still looked at sort of as the other rather than as part of. Um, the third one is transformation, and this approach assumes that there is no single valid way of understanding people. In other words, you know, we don't look at uh, learning and teaching and understanding just from one um, one lens, but we have a multi-lens view in terms of what, what we look at. So the example given here is... Um, um, uh, the evolution of European settlers' perspective on native rights. The attitude towards native rights in the 1600s was competitive colonialism. That later became hegemony. Um, and then finally, administrative colonialism under the Indian Act. Remarkably, only since 1968 have native people been able to exercise any decision-making autonomy over their lives and lands. Clearly, their perceptions of social justice during these periods are radically different. So, you know, looking at the evolution of and the change in the ways in which we have looked at various viewpoints um, is transformative. So it becomes this more transformative way of looking at um, how we have viewed um, perspectives through um, through the years. And then finally, the last one is social action. And this includes all the components of the previous ones, but the students help to make decisions and take actions concerning these. So it's really doing something about it. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a huge big thing, but some, some, something that students are engaged in, in understanding the multicultural world in which we live in. I've given you a link for Rethinking Schools, which is a, a group um, who, um, advocates for multicultural teaching and social justice in teaching. And um, that's going to be part of your discussion forum this week. Um, I encourage you to spend some time with the Rethinking Schools um, journal. There's a lot of really, really good articles that are free um, to look at. Some of you have to purchase, but there's plenty there to look at, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so, do, so do think about multicultural education and how you might approach that in a classroom, if you're going into a classroom. Um, particularly if you're going, if you're going to an area of Maine 
um, that may be very homogeneous. How will you help those students to understand um, a diverse perspective? How will you help them to understand that there are more than one, there's more than one way of looking at the world and that sometimes we have to get out of our own way um, to think about that? And it's very difficult if we live, you know, in sort of this very enclave um, community where we only see people who look like us or talk like us or think like us. Um, it's a real challenge for teachers to be respectful of of the, those students' um, cultural backgrounds and familial backgrounds, but to stretch their thinking enough so that they can think outside of their own own group uh, and come, come become better, you know, world citizens. In fact. And the, the last thing I want to just talk a bit about is, is teacher expectations. Teacher expectations is huge. It can it can be it can it can mean it can mean so sorry. It can mean success or it can mean failure. And so if you have a, a, a group of students in front of you, um, we always say we have high expectations for all our students, and we absolutely should have high expectations for all our students. But that doesn't mean that the expectations are the same for each student. We have to be careful about that. If we have a student, you know, a, a, or several students, who are coming from an impoverished background, who may not have enough to eat at home, um, who may not be clothed properly for the weather, um, who, you know, all of these things are factors. Um, and so we have to understand that we want high standards for this particular group of students, but we have to be able to, to meet them where they are and scaffold them. In other words, helping them to, to, to be able to um, engage in the academic work that we want. If we just, just simply say, everybody's going to be able to do this, without any thinking about the, these students individually or groups of students, um, we can instill you know, failure in these students. We can destroy this, what little self-esteem they may have, you know. So we have to be very careful about our expectations um, for students. The other piece of that is is cultural expectations. And so um, m many students who come to us from, say, um, I'm going to I'm going to choose Asian um, students because uh, um, in the Asian schools, often the paradigm is that the teacher is sort of the very autocratic uh, expert who um, who disseminates information and students listen and they're very quiet okay and there's no not much interaction um, and if so if you have students in your class who who come from this kind of a background and it may not just be Asian there are other other populations who have this um, this paradigm for teacher student relationships and you want them to engage in student centered group work you're going to have to help them to understand why why they should do that and why that's important to their educational process. Um, if you just ask them to do it, they're they're not going to do well. So again, we have to think about you know their cultural background and what the norms are, what they believe the norms are for student teacher relationships. And if we're expecting something different from that, we we're going to have to help students get to that point. And even you know even in a, a, a homogeneous classroom, you know with with it's sort of a typical um, main school. Um, we're still going to have to help them to think outside the box in terms of what it means to not just sit and get, um, but to, um, that's, the, that's the Texas method of learning, by the way, sit, get, and spit. Um, you know, so if that's, if you want to get them out of that paradigm and want them to be more engaged in their own learning, um, and you want them to be, um, you know, to, to question and be a critical thinker, you, your expectations are going to have to be um, adjusted so that you can get them to that point. Just expecting them to do it and know it is not going to be enough. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, do look again on page 469. Um, Very important, I think, for us to think about um, our own biases and where we are with those and, and how we think about that in terms of, of diversity. Um, do spend some time with the um, articles on socioeconomic um, status. Um, think about what poverty means to our, our students, you know. If we could solve poverty, we could solve everything in education. I sincerely believe that. Um, with all the reform movements that are going on today, and um, with the controversy around Common Core State Standards and standardized testing and raising scores and being, you know, the whole swirl of conversation about the United States lagging behind in national scores, our students are not up to par with others. Um, frankly, if again, I, I sincerely believe that this is mostly a result of, of impoverished children who simply are not academically ready to um, be on the same playing field as some other students. And there are stu have been studies done that, you know, if you el eliminate that population and look at middle class, you know, upper class, 
um, families and students, we're, we're, we're high on the scores. In fact, we're probably up there with number one and number two. But when you factor in the high rate of poverty in this country and what that does to students, um, you know, our, we sink down in the ratings. So if we as a nation could solve poverty, um, if all of our children were well fed, well, well clothed, um, and prepared for school in excellent preschool um, and pre-kindergarten programs, um, we'll, we'll see our students do much better. Um, and I sincerely believe that. Um, so I'd appreciate, you know, and I'd, I'd welcome your thoughts on that as well. There's been a plenty written about it. There's been plenty of research done on that. Um, so in terms of socioeconomic um, status and um, as we think of diversity, just a huge thing to think about in the state of Maine. Um, so with that, I'm going to say goodbye, and thanks again for um, tuning in.